I mean, for me, it's it's all about moving away from the stigma of ABV and, and beer just being beer, whether it's 0.5 or 4.5 and and people drinking beer for, for the flavour and the quality and not being hung up about how strong it is. Hello and welcome to We Are Beer People, a podcast all about the many different people who help us enjoy beer. I'm your host, Rob Cadwell, and I reckon if you're listening to this, then there's a good chance that you are one of the beer people too. You might be involved in the world of beer, you may want to find out more about the industry, or perhaps you simply enjoy drinking the stuff. So join me now as I have a chat with one of the beer people. Today, we're taking a leap of faith from what is, if we're honest, the perfectly stable ground beneath our feet and taking the risk and opportunity of the high seas. And in some ways, that's the journey that today's guest has taken. I'm speaking with Sonia Mitchell, the managing director or beer admiral of Jumpship Brewing, an alcohol-free beer brand that started when Sonia, an avid sailor, had had enough of low alcohol beers not coming close to the Scottish beers she enjoyed. And so Sonia quite literally jumped ship from her day job to brew her own. And after much work and many brews, their lager Yardarm achieved best known low alcohol lager in the World Beer Awards. Flash forward to today, and jump ships a small crew of shipmates with a brewery under construction in Midlothian, with its sights set on making the world a little better along the way. And I caught up with Sonia. Ahoy, Sonia, and a very big welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me aboard. Thank you for coming on. So we're recording this through the magic of the internet today. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're recording from and help paint a picture for our listeners? Uh, So I'm sitting in Edinburgh at the moment um, in what uh, is the remnants of our temporary office. And we've we've actually moved out now to the new brewery site, down in um, Midlothian, where the, the tanks arrived on Monday. Um, but I'm back in the office today because we've left behind a lot of kegs, a lot of brewing equipment, a lot of boxes that once I've finished talking to you, I'm going to have to go and deal with that. <laughs> it's always a big part of brewing, probably after cleaning, is moving things around. Yes. And um, for those that don't know you, can you take us back to the beginning and tell us why beer and what brought you here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I've always loved beer and as soon as I could get myself into a pub that's what I was drinking and played a lot of rugby so a big beer culture there um and I just kind of hit a point um in my late 30s when um I still really wanted a nice beer on the Tuesday night but the alcohol wasn't working for me anymore um boys had bad hangovers and now had three kids and just waking up in the morning feeling really tetchy and irritable just I just didn't have time for that anymore so um so we started just did dry January in 2018 ordered a mixed load of beers um most of them were disappointing alcohol-free beers um a couple were okay and I started drinking alcohol-free beer and think this is great I'm still having a beer it's Tuesday don't have to worry about tomorrow but it wasn't as good as the beer that I was used to drinking. Um, I moved up to Scotland 14 years ago now, and I've very much made it my home. There's a lot of great breweries up here, particularly in Edinburgh. We're very lucky. Um, and I was just like, why am I drinking a German lager when I used to be drinking like a really lovely crafted beer? And it just felt really wrong that I was being forced to make a different choice just because I didn't the alcohol and it. it really annoyed me. Um and I just, I don't know why, it just the idea took hold of me. And I was like, well, if no one else is going to do it, then I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> so I don't have a background in the drinks industry. I don't have a background in brewing. But I just thought, well, maybe I'll just just see if I can make one that tastes nice. So I did a, a startup brewing course, which I loved. I just totally thought the whole magic of brewing is amazing. The mixture of biochemistry and engineering and the history behind it all. 
Um, but I also realized that I probably needed a an undergraduate degree from Harriet Watt as well. Um, um, and while I was there, I, I met a, a brewer who had, he'd, he'd done a low alcohol recipe before and I said, would, would, he, would he be willing to work with me on an uh, under 0.5 recipe? And he said, yeah. So I got together a brief for the beer I wanted. I was quite clear that I wanted it to be a lager because I felt lager had been so abused and so alcohol free um, beer and it just never quite gets enough love. And, and I really enjoy um, kind of a, a full flavoured a craft lager. So we took that as the starting point, brewed three different batches on sort of 30 litre kit. And one was terrible, one was okay, and one was amazing. So I had my brown sample bottles and shared them out with friends. I took them to my local independent bottle shops. And I got this really consistent feedback that this beer is great. And when can we when can we buy it? So I was like, okay, right, I've done the first bit, which is to make a beer that I think is better than what's out there already. And I really want to drink this beer, so I'm going to have to make it commercially. And that was a huge leap then. And I think if I know what I know now, I probably wouldn't have got started. But at that point, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I just, I, I just, just was very naive. I I was really determined to to brew the beer in Scotland because for me, beer comes from somewhere and it has a provenance to it. So trying to find a a brewery in Scotland willing to work with me that that wasn't too big and that wasn't too busy, that wasn't too small, (laughs) took took a while. Um, I think, you know, I was just this random woman clutching a technical recipe sheet with a dream. Um, But eventually I I found somewhere willing to to give give it a go and I handed over the, the the recipe um and I kind of thought they're they're the brewers they'll know how to do it I'm not a brewer and I was there for the brew day it was all very exciting went away came back a month later to can the beer tasted the beer and it tasted nothing like this amazing beer that I had been dreaming about and so that was a really really difficult day um very pressurized and I was already I had my customers lined up I had you know I was, I was supposed to launch in five days time and I just like this this beer isn't good enough um, so we had to start again. Um, and I think at that point, I realized that actually this was a lot going to be a lot harder, um, that, that scaling up a recipe is not as simple as just increasing the numbers, that there's lots of variables in brewing in terms of the different kit, different water, the different ingredients, different brewers, different techniques, um, and that yeast is organic and live. You know, it, it, it's going to do different things. So we tried again and it didn't work. Um, and then by the time we came around to try the third time round, by that point, they just got too busy. It was like, you know, you need to find somewhere else. Um, so that was literally the day I'd launched my crowdfunding. So I kind of launched the crowdfunding um, to, to, to pre-sell to, to sort of pre-sell my first brew. And I had this incredible response to it. And it got picked up in the media and I was kind of being interviewed on Radio Scotland. And I was like, I don't know where I'm going to make this beer. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I, I'd, I'd already started talking to another brewer and they had the time and they just said, you tell us what to do, we'll do it. I went back to basics and brewed the beer again at small scale to make sure the recipe was right. I then scaled the recipe myself to um, to make sure that I was happy. I got the water analysis. I just I kind of realized that I needed to take control of it. You know, okay, I wasn't a brewer, but I, I didn't know quite a lot about my particular beer and, and no one cared about it as much as I did. So it was on me to get it right. And I also knew at that point that it was probably going to go wrong the first time we brewed it there, just because, again, we were getting used to the, the kit. And so the first time we brewed, it over-fermented, but it did taste brilliant. And so I kind of thought, if we've got the flavor right, because that was the thing we hadn't been able to get right before, we can manage the fermentation better on the next run. And that's what we did. And I got the beer and we launched. So so that was <laughs> a, a, a long and quite emotional, emotional year. I bet that must have been an amazing feeling. Yeah. yeah. From that glorious launch and the launch party in January, we were sort of straight into 2020 and COVID. So that was, I think, like everyone, I sort of felt like the bottom had dropped out of my world. The the brewery that I was working with furloughed for five months um, because they were at that point very driven by cask. And um, like many breweries, their customer base dried up. So I think we were the last brew. So I had some beer in the pipeline, but 2020 was was really about 
just managing with the beer that I had. I can't imagine how that must have felt during the pandemic and that all coming along, obviously impacting where you were brewing. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, I think if you'd sort of asked me like at the end of March 2020, I think I, I thought maybe it was just all over because the world felt so strange. Um, it, it was so kind of frightening to see how brewery orders had collapsed, how the pubs closed. And then also personally, I've got three kids to homeschool. It's just like, how? How is this even possible? Um, but then, yeah, just kind of bit by bit, you kind of realise that there were new ways of working. And I think there was just a real upswelling of support in Edinburgh. And I think it happened across the UK to support people looking around who are our local businesses, who are our local brewers. How can we support them? Amongst the breweries in Edinburgh, there was kind of a good network of support. And then just I literally just put a PayPal button on my website and people started ordering beer and I was like I don't know who these people are and I've only been in business for a couple of months but um so I laid up my car on a Thursday afternoon put the kids in the back listening to an audio book <laughs> going to live a beer in after head and breath wow. um and and some of those you know people are still still ordering with us now so um so I, I grew I grew much slower in my first year because I just never knew when I was going to have beer. And even when things opened up in the summer of 2020, there was a massive shortage of cans, trying to get production slots. Um, everything was just extremely bumpy. So I think I kind of I just kind of thought if I got, get to the end of this year and I'm still in business and I'm still standing, then that actually is quite an achievement. <laughs> Definitely. I think if you can do it, then you can probably do it in the in the good times as well. Yeah. I don't really feel like I've had the good times yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just as we're coming out of COVID, then, uh, you know, the, uh, the energy and cost of massive inflation that sort of kicked off last year. Right there. there was a moment last year when it felt like we were going back. That kind of, that sense of real uncertainty. You know, I was looking at the cost of new energy contracts for, for a new brewery site and the, the quotes we were getting back were just like, not, you know, it's like, I can't run a business at a pound a kilowatt hour. But yeah, so we've got, We've got through that and we're still here. So they kind of say to me, if you can if you can start a business in difficult times, then you're in good stead for the future. Absolutely. And I think you've probably answered this in a way, but when you're thinking about going from jumping ship to actually jumping ship and setting up jump ship, was it a single jump or a lot of little jumps? I think it was a lot of little jumps. I mean, I think there there was sort of um so from the point of having the idea and developing the recipes. That, that I kind of did that as whilst I was still doing my other job. A big jump came when I sort of had to sort of make it commercially. Probably my next big jump was taking on my first employee, um, because then that was wasn't just about me; it was having you know having a, a responsibility to to someone else. And then um, I guess another big jump was at the end of last year when we made the decision to to raise funds, and then the huge leap into to have an iron brewery and, and all of that so um so yeah so it's this kind of been and I think there will continue to be these kind of moments of like okay right now now it's going to change again and I feel we're kind of we're at a point now where everything is changing you know we're almost not quite building the business from scratch but I'm building a new business because we, we've got our own brewery um we've got our own, you know for the first time we've got total control of our production it kind of opens up so many more opportunities for, for us and the way we want to brew our beer, the types of beer we want to brew, how we can bring people in and show show what we're doing, having a home. You know, I've also got, got a team of five now. Um, there's only two of us back in May and uh, the types of customers that we're looking to to, to, to work with moving forward um, is kind of all changing again. And I think also for the first time, I feel like I really look at our whole supply chain from a sustainability point of view and and to really start to to measure what we're doing in terms of carbon and and, and start to really push forward there as well. Because I think while I've not had control of my supply chain, it's kind of always been a bit frustrating not to be able to do more there. It sounds like you've produced a, a brilliant product or products and you've sort of proven that people love it, even if you've had to do it in a way that's where you've had sort of varying degrees of control over it. So I guess setting up the brewery in your own space will allow you to take control of it and have, you know, being in charge of your destiny to a greater extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think in the, in the alcohol-free space, there's quite a few brands out there, but there's not many who are making the beer themselves. Most of it's done, done on contract. And so 
I think for us to be able to tap tap and control that, you know, in, in terms of really pushing the boundaries, you know, I think for me, it's only all the data points because um, we'll be there with the beer every day, you know, monitoring the fermentations hourly. I just think we'll get such better information that's going to enable us to to tweak things, to improve things, to test things, to try things out, to get a few more things wrong. Because I think that's that's what's hard with the contract model is you have your brew slot. And if, if that goes wrong, you might not have another brew slot for six weeks and then you're screwed. So, so we've had to sort of be quite risk averse. Um, whereas, you know, I'm quite keen to, to try a few more things that might not work out. But I know we're going to learn a lot from them. Absolutely. And is the plan then that the brewery site would be somewhere that people can visit? Yeah, it's in, it's in a lovely place um, called Rosemain Studying. It's some old farm buildings that have been converted into business units and it's kind of a, a community of makers and producers down there. So we've got our neighbours, uh, got coffee roaster. We've got someone who's got a wildflower meadow making skin to care botanicals. So it's a really nice creative bunch of people down there. So we, we're organising quarterly markets and things like that. We're going to have a little tasting room. And I think we're just going to just test a few things out and see who comes. Um, so we're going to be having some brewery tours in January. Um, and we're going to use them as a chance to see who comes along, what they're interested in, what they'd like us to do to do more of. Um, I think in the summertime, there's lots we can do with the outside space there. And uh, yeah, I think we're just going to try things out and see what works, what doesn't work. We're, we're also a small team, so I don't think we want to work every weekend. No. <laughs> Um, but, um, but yeah, I think for me, like I, I've, I've always loved brewery tours. I've loved tap rooms. I kind of love like, being right next to where the beer is being made. And, and I think, um, particularly if you don't drink at all, those kind of experiences are currently quite closed off for you. So I think to have like this really welcoming, inclusive space where we can kind of open up the magic of beer to, to, to a different audience who's currently being excluded from it. then that to me is really exciting. Absolutely. I think that's really interesting. Though. I mean, lots of us have been on brewery tours, but I don't think many people will have been on alcohol-free brewery tours and to learn how that process differs and how it happens and how you can craft a low alcohol beer. Yeah, definitely. I know I'd, 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 I'd go one of those. So most of my decisions tend to be based on what would I like? Yeah. And then do other people like that too. There's always that thing, isn't there? You're often visiting an industrial estate or a, you know a farm building, outbuildings, those kinds of things and driving. And that doesn't always pair well with you know, visiting a brewery. But if you can go there and drink alcohol free and low alcohol beers, then that can help. And that's certainly a, a great destination to have. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not too far from Edinburgh. So we're about sort of 30 minutes drive from central Edinburgh. So oh, um, I'm hoping people will, will come out and visit. And there's, you know, it's a nice place to go and walk your dog and things like that as well. Absolutely. Lots of reasons to visit there then. What would you say to younger Sonia or to someone else who's looking to get into beer in this way? I'd say good luck. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it is, it's really, it's really, it's, it's really hard. Um, I think as, as I'm kind of learning, you need to keep the faith because it's, it's hard work. Um, and particularly if, um, you know, if you want to, to set up a brewery, the margins are tight. You've really got to make sure that the numbers stack up. I think you need to be really motivated and excited by what you're doing because there are going to be some really tough times and it is kind of having that goal that will keep you getting through them knowing that that you you're going to get there and and you've got to have fun with it because you know it's, it is it can be all consuming sometimes and I think I would say to my younger self is just be kind to yourself because it's going to be tough and there's going to be times when you're exhausted when you're stressed um, and when it feels overwhelming just kind of keep taking those deep breaths and and moving forward that's really solid advice there um how did your previous roles and i guess your experience with sailing help you when setting up and managing jump ship i think sailing you've, you've always got to have a plan b in sailing um because you never know what's going to fail on the boat um so i think that that kind of being prepared for things to go wrong um is is helpful I think also I get a lot of confidence from my sailing. My husband and I did a six-month sabbatical um, and sailed around the, the, the Western Mediterranean and got ourselves in some pretty hairy situations, but we got through them. So I kind of sometimes sit down and I'll imagine, I can imagine when you're up the uh, east coast of Sardinia and that gale came in and, and actually we got through that. 
because then you know with with, with sailing you, you know sometimes it's a matter of life or death um and and also just a lot of fun and a lot of pleasure and so um I think that the naming of my business jump ship it's both from like I, I jump ship from everything I need to do this um but it also brings in that that sailing terminology and, and all the beers have got a nautical flavor to them because it's something that's given me a lot of pleasure and happiness and I like to bring that through into the beers um I guess professionally I, I worked in marketing before I moved into this and I did in my sort of start of my career I, I joined Unilever as a brand manager which I think gave me a good understanding of of a brand from all the way through. So I work with the factories, I work with sales, I work with packaging, production, innovation, all of that together. So I, you know, when I was here, I'm working on a much tinier scale than Unilever. I think that that's kind of stayed with me as a brand has to be consistent all the way through the process from how you brew it, how you make it, what it looks like, how you treat people. It's all really quarter to everything and then how you make your decisions. And on the flip side, were there other skills and things that you needed to develop as you went into jump ship? Uh, loads. <laughs> I think logistics is, is not my strong point, but something that I've had to to get my head around in terms of um, planning, production, um, how beer gets moved around. Um, it's been brilliant. Uh, Pete joined as, as head brewer a couple of years ago. It's great to have his support with that. Sales is really a critical part of that. And I didn't know anything about the, the whole on trade, like how you sell into pubs and bars and restaurant groups and wholesalers and how that whole system works. So that, that's that been quite a steep, a steep learning curve. How to manage multiple things kicking off at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just, I mean... I kind of come constantly confronted by things that I don't know how to do um, and I've not done before. Um, and I just kind of have to keep saying to myself, I don't know how to do this yet. Um, and I guess as I take, move through each stage, it's like, well, I didn't know how to do that. You know, like basic things like to begin with, like I didn't know how to find a warehouse. Um, you know, I didn't know how a logistics company worked. How do how how will I move my beer to London? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, so it's just like, it's just, Every day, there's things I don't know how to do, um, and you know the, the brewery just takes that to the next level in terms of stuff that I need to organise. So, um, yeah, every day is a school day. I think is the expression. Absolutely, <laughs> it's sort of everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, and I guess that changed a bit from at the start. You were doing lots of that yourself, but now you have a, a, a team that's sort of growing around the business, where you're able to draw on their expertise as well to sort of grow and develop the business yeah that's 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 great um having a team um obviously bringing in pete with his his brewing knowledge colin joined in june he's our head of sales and he's been working in the scottish on trade for 20 years and you know, he knows he's got the connections he knows how it's work and it's, it's kind of i can learn a lot from that having some more support on the marketing side of that. I think, I don't think I realized that like social media would be so overwhelming in, in running a business, but it is, it is really hard because it's the thing that is still getting you at 10 o'clock at night because that's when people are posting and to having some support on that side as well in the last couple of months has been, been great. Oh, brilliant. And I'm sure there's no typical day or week for you, but could you walk us through what maybe a, a week might look like for you? There's always sort of the, production meeting working out what brews we've got coming up um checking stock levels thinking ahead so you know what we're going to brew next so we might have we might have a couple of test brews underway so we might sit and taste them as a team talk about them we like to sit and also like taste what else what other new beers are coming out in the market just to see what else is out there you know what's good, where the gaps are, what we could do better. There's a fair amount of admin in terms of managing invoices, cash flow forecasts, all of all of the important stuff um, I don't love doing, but I have learned to uh, see the importance of dealing with new customer incoming inquiries. Before I, I used to deal with them all directly now, so quite a lot's passed on to Colin, but 
going out. So go last week, we went to Bonnie and Wild, one of our big customers in Edinburgh, doing training with their team. Um, so, so it's helping them to understand the beers, understand alcohol-free drinkers, um, uh, learn about from them, you know, when people are ordering our beers and then what they like. Quite a lot of, you know, in terms of the, the, the brewery project, that's in full flow. So sitting down with Pete, working out what pieces of equipment have been ordered, what's been delivered, what's still what's to come. Are we still on track? And just, just trying to troubleshoot things that <laughs> that might go wrong or what happens if they don't, you know, if that doesn't get delivered on time, we're still going to be able to brew before Christmas. And, you know, as, as, as I grow the team, sitting down with them individually, um, making sure that, you know, they're clear with, with what their plan is, how I can support them and, uh, and, and being clear on what our targets are for the next, next, next week. And also now, you know, looking forward into 2024 as well. I do a fair amount of chatting to, to other business, the other business owners, whether it's, um, other brewers or just other sort of startup businesses, food and drink businesses around in, in Scotland. There's a great community there. So asking questions, sharing ideas and the kind of ways that we can collaborate. And there's always that bit of social media posting still or responding to, to comments and questions and, and keeping engaged with the people who are following us. And, you know, who like to post about what beers they're drinking. I think that, that for me is, like I still I deal with all our sort of customer care myself. So I love it when people who order our beef on website get in touch or it might just be that their parcel went astray or something wasn't right, that they're getting that fixed for them and and making sure they're, they're happy is, is something that I enjoy doing. I hope you're enjoying our chat. And if you like what you're hearing, there are a few things you can do that will really help us out and help other people find the podcast. Number one, follow or subscribe to We Are Beer People podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review or rating. Number two, share the episode on your socials or even in actual real life. And if you want to stay up to date with all things We Are Beer People, you can visit our website, which is wearebeerpeople.co.uk, where you can sign up for a monthly newsletter. And you can follow us on social media at We Are Beer People, all one word. And if you have any questions or comments or want to hear from any particular beer people, send me a message via the website or on social media. Now, back to the podcast. That's all really exciting. Do you have, um, out of all of those things, and there's lots there, do you have kind of a favourite role or a favourite hat to wear? Uh, oh, it's got to be the recipe development side of it when we're deciding what to brew next, um, tasting the batches, thinking about what could be improved. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the magic. And I guess the other side is, is interacting with the people who are drinking our beer. So when we get to do events with someone trying our beer for the first time, going, oh, it's amazing. Because there is still a bit of skepticism about alcohol-free beer. Is it going to taste good? And I think when, when we did a festival in the summer and a, and a guy came up and was just like, uh, just have one of your pints by mistake. Um, but now we're back for another one. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another convert. Absolutely. I think it's the thing that at the moment you're seeing, or you're starting to see alcohol-free beers uh, make their way into lunchtime meal deals and things at supermarkets. Yeah. Which I don't think you would have seen even 12 months ago. No, no. And I think that's that's the kind of thing. It's, it's, it's the first step is people trying it for the first time and then it's beginning to kind of unlock all the times when you didn't have a beer because it was alcoholic. But now it's not alcoholic. Oh, you can have it with lunch. You know, it's it's great. And actually it's probably a lot healthier for you than having a can of Coke or something with your lunch. Definitely. Lots of electrolytes yeah. going on there. Um, and I guess it's as well the people who might have had alcohol-free beers, you know, a decade or, or so ago. They're very different to what we have now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're just about four years in with Junkship and it has changed so much just in those four years from the choices that are available when I started to to what's available now. Um, which I think for me is it's really exciting because I think once people have tried a, an alcohol-free beer and liked it, then they start looking around for more because it's not just about this is the one beer you can drink. It's just there's an incredible variety of styles um, out there now. So it's um, it's quite an exciting time to be out on the booze. And where would you like to go with the business? I think for, for me, there's the kind of getting the brewery properly bedded in, 
firing up that big beer engine and um and really making that that our home and 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 a destination and doing more different beer styles and getting our beer better known and into more places so um there's still a lot of people who haven't heard of jump ship um and there's you know there's 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 loads of opportunity still i think to 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 expand distribution of our beer so um yeah i kind of feel it's it's all to play for really in the next in the next year or two and does the brewery open next year uh yes so um so yeah we'll be having some brewery tours in in january and then we'll be working out our plan for the rest of the year um whether it's having you know once a month on a Sunday or something like that, have an opening. So, so yeah, so there, there will be sort of hopefully lots of opportunities next year to, to come and have a visit. We were hoping to have our first brew in before Christmas. I'd say that's now 50-50, but um, we, we are imminently about to brew up and batch of beer in our new brewery, which um, should be exciting. And I think it will probably be Yardum, which is the lager that, that started it all is probably like the most finickety beer to start off with but i figure if we can if we can cut our teeth on that one then the others should be easy oh excellent can you talk us through a little bit about how you do go about brewing one of your alcohol free beers yeah so so our beers are designed to be less than 0.5 so we bring to strength rather than brewing something alcoholic and stripping the alcohol out which for me i mean a lot of the um to take the alcohol out, you generally need a big industrial process like vacuum distillation, which is a big and expensive equipment. And, and I don't think necessarily improves the flavor um, because by extracting the alcohol, you're generally taking out some of the flavor as well. Um, and then there are some, some alcohol-free beers made which don't have any yeast in and it's kind of basically a beer soda, so carbonating malt syrups to help extracts. For me, that's... That's not a proper beer. Uh, so we use standard brewing equipment, standard normal brewing ingredients, so water, barley, yeast, and hops. And what we're doing is managing every stage of the process to, 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 to minimize the amount of sugars produced that the yeast can turn into alcohol. Looking at the types of yeast that we use, so lazy yeast that aren't so good at turning sugars into alcohol and then managing the temperatures as well. So um, so we use we use diff- some different grains and, and less grain in the mash. Um, mash temperature tends to be a bit higher. Yeah, managing the temperature of the fermentation um, carefully. Some of our beers will naturally stop below 0.5. Some of them we need to, to stop them. So it's just a case of watching and, and, and monitoring it really carefully but but it kind of means that the beer tastes like it's supposed to we're not we're not we're not you know adding anything to it and uh and yeah and it is trying to get the, the mouth fill and the flavor in because alcohol itself is a flavor component of beer it also gives a lot of mouthful and a lot of body so when you when you don't have the alcohol you've got to to work to really hard to compensate for that um, we tend to use a lot of oats in not all of our beers, not in the lager, but in, in some of our other beers to kind of get get body in, and um, so it's speciality malts to sort of get more flavour um, in. But it, but it is amazing that that small amount of fermentation really does transfer all in the beer from kind of sweet wort into to something really delicious. And I can taste the difference between a beer at 0.1 and 0.3. It's, you know, that that tiny little trace, it makes all the difference. And I think, as I do sometimes get asked, I don't know if, if it's a question you've had that, um, you know, is it alcohol free if it's less than 0.5? And if we take the view that it's kind of in line with what most of the world defines as alcohol free. Um, and you really, it's comparable to the alcohol you'd find in a, a large ripe banana. Um, and actually, if it was a, a ginger beer or a kombucha, I wouldn't even need to put anything in the can. It's just because it's a beer that I, that I need to to describe it. But um, but yeah, um, I tend to find that um, I prefer the flavours of a, a zero point five rather than a zero zero beer. And this is definitely more of a hands on process through you know mashing and boiling, but also I guess mainly through fermentation. So you're having to be 
it was very closely monitoring that to make sure that the fermentation is doing what it needs to do. Yes, yes. Um, and, and also pasteurization is an important part of the process at the end, um, which you know, an alcohol-free beer is essentially like a soft drink. It doesn't have a, alcohol as a big preservative. So if you're taking that out, <clears throat> uh, and that's actually something that I found really tricky at kind of craft craft production. There's not many places that offer that. Um, so that's probably been one of the, the hardest things is, is finding places to pass pros beer in the last couple of years. So I'm excited to have all of that equipment on site as well. Oh, that's going to make such a big difference, isn't it, to, to all of that? Yeah. So you just be able to play around and tweak things and innovate and, and all that all on your doorstep. Yeah. I mean, even if from like the pasteurization is also part of the process that can affect the flavor as well. And um, getting that balance between um, not sort of pasteurizing it so heavily that you've killed the flavor, but, but that you've protected the beer. So even being able to sort of really refine that as well would be great. And so for Jump Ship, it all started with Yardarm. But what's your favorite beer? Um, I tend to have a different beer for different moods. And I, I really enjoy having the range. So I kind of at the moment, the stout is going down a treat. <laughs> but um, I think probably my favorite beer will always be Yardarm because I feel like I've gone on such a, a journey with it. Um, you know, if, if it hadn't have been so good at the start, I might never have got started. If it hadn't have been so good at the start, I might not have taken that next step. And if it hadn't have been such a good beer, I wouldn't have pushed so hard in that first year to get the quality right and to to to, to launch with something that reflected the quality of the recipe I developed. So, and it is an easy beer to to drink a lot of, and it's one that I'm hoping to be able to be pouring pints of next year as, as we get get our keg production sorted so um uh yeah so i, I mean there's there's lots more beers and i'm, I'm certainly we've, we've got a lovely galaxy ipa um which was called goose Rim, which is out of production for a month or so and i'm looking forward to having that back because that's got a really lovely tropical hot pit to it but um if i had to just pick one it would be all done oh, fantastic i love the i'm just going to lean over here but i've got your cans here i love the designs on them they're so they called obviously I don't know the name. Are they nautical flags or? Yeah. So it's basically the nautical flag alphabet. Mm-hmm. Um, so each letter of the alphabet has its own flag. Um, so the flags that we use on the beer cans are connected to the beer. So that's the Y, A and L flags on on the Yardarm can. Um, we've got the F and the C on the flying colours. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of I like using the flags in it. We can have fun with the, the messages and they're kind of bright and colourful and cheerful. Yeah, it's really nice. It's really distinctive. So it's its own thing. And on, on their own, they look really eye-catching. But I guess it's also if you know, you know. So if someone yeah. isn't sailing, they will know exactly what that means straight away. Um, and what's your favourite place to enjoy a beer? Oh, well, it's pretty got to be on a boat, hasn't it? And, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't get to do as much sailing as I'd like to, probably only sort of two or three days a year at the moment. Um, but I think there's is that lovely feeling when you kind of drop anchor at the end of the day sailing and you're just cracking open that first beer and just sitting and enjoying the surroundings and just taking a breath and enjoying a, a good day out. And what's the... One thing you wish people knew about beer, what's the biggest misconception that you think people have? I think it's the incredible range of flavours. So when people say, I don't like beer, I just think you just haven't found the right beer. Like I, I, I kind of, I really believe there's a beer out there for every, everyone, um, from sweet, sour, bitter, hoppy, tropical, juicy, punchy, dark. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe you can't like beer I haven't tried hard enough definitely an advocate for there's a beer for every occasion yeah and what are you most excited about in in the world of beer I'm, I'm, I mean for me it's it's all about moving away from the, the the stigma of ABV and and beer just being beer whether it's 0.5 or 4.5 um and and people drinking beer for for the flavor and the quality and not being hung up about how strong it is. And have there been any people that have been particularly influential or instrumental in your beer career? Yeah, I mean, there's been so many people along the way who have helped me out 
um, I think James, who is the head brewer, the first at, at Alchemy, where we did our first brews, um, you know, he, he really gave me a lot of time in in helping me get the the recipes right and getting it getting the beer brewed. I think for me, as as a woman in beer, seeing people like Jago Wise and and what they're doing um, is is really inspirational, um, both as a brewer and a business owner. Scotland's a a fantastic place to launch a business. I've had um, a lot of support from from organisations like Scottish Edge, which is a sort of a business funding competition from Scottish Enterprise, from a programme called Unlocking Ambition, where I kind of got to spend time along a cohort of other other founders and been given access to to lots of support, to inspirational speakers. And I think um, the amount of sort of goodwill I feel towards Jumpship and the number of people who want us to succeed and to do well, that, that really really makes a difference and I think being able to to kind of just just reach out to other people who whether they're brewers or not just to kind of share the opinion as well of what it's like to, to grow a business has, has been really important to me and uh, we talked about your uh, the can design earlier but how did you come up with the different names as well that you use for the beers once we kind of came up with jump ship then we knew we were in a, a nautical <laughs> and a nautical line of thinking um and um i worked with a brilliant guy called jerry who kind of been creative director in a the lead agency a big scottish agency so he's like he's got a brilliant creative mind and just sit down and kind of creating lists of, of lots of different nautical names and uh yardarm stuck out because it was um it's got a bit of a story behind it as well um so i don't know if you ever heard the expression sun's over the yard on it's yeah, time yeah. for a drink yeah. um so that all dates back to the old days of the navy when um the yard arm is a mast a spar on the mast and and uh once the sun was high enough over that spar then sailors were given their first uh drop of rum um, so, um, so kind of, you know, and with our beer, obviously the sun's over the other one, so I can have it any time of day. Um, and, uh, yes, so kind of with each new beer that comes in, um, we kind of think about the kind of beer we're making, what the occasion is, and then, um, go back to our kind of probably got like a whole book of multiple names that, that we kind of go through and, and spark ideas and then check no one else is using them and uh, and away we go <laughs> and um we're recording this at the end of november and i think we'll share this in december or january but what have you got coming up in the next few months once we've got the brewery up and running um there's a lot, lot of beer to be brewed so so keeping uh coming back to all of our core beers getting them out there we might look at brushing some of them up a little bit just because you know We'll be making them ourselves, and we 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 committed to doing a crowdsourced beer with the people who came in on our equity crowd fund this year. So that's going to be a bit of fun. Oh, but what are you doing with that? Are, you, are they able to sort of help come up with the recipe and? That? Yeah, so we're going to sort of ask people what different styles and flavour profiles that they that they would like, and uh, kind of narrow that down to the beer that we brew. Then we'll ask them to help name the beer and, and all the rest of it. So um, it'd be interesting to see kind of how crazy people are or whether they just want something quite kind of sessionable and, and easygoing. Going to be doing a, uh, a new version of um, sort of Galaxy Heavy IPA. Um, we'll be looking forward to our sort of more, sort of the next edition of our Shore Leaf beer, so something maybe heading as, as, it, as we come out of winter. We'd also like to do some collaborations next year. It's not something that we've done a huge amount of um, so far, but it would be fun to get some different breweries into our brewery, um, maybe particularly ones who've not done alcohol free before, and uh, kind of do more of that creative sharing of ideas. Yeah, and then and keg as well will be something that we've not really been able to do yet, but I think. There is, it's still quite a small market, but I think there are places where people are really looking to enjoy an alcohol free pint. So to be able to offer for our beers will be, will be amazing. 
That'd be really cool. It's, I think, definitely one of those things. But when you can serve it in the same way that other people are ordering pints, it does help break down those barriers as well. So you're not going and getting a can or a bottle where other people might get, be getting something in a glass. Yeah, it's just you're having a pint of beer. It doesn't really matter what the ABV is. Um, so I think for me, that is is the ultimate, really, um, for, 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 for no and no drinking becoming mainstream. I've read on your website as well, you're donating 10% of your profits to good causes. Was that something that came around at the very beginning or is that something you've sort of set up recently? Um, no, I set it up from the very, very start. Um, I, I worked in the charity sector for, for a few years um, and um, for me, giving back is is really important and um, to have it um, ingrained in the business from the start. Um, it's kind of, I think it's kind of easier to do it when, you know, that everything's quite small and then it grows. So I, I'm kind of looking forward to as we grow the business that becoming uh, a sort of a chunkier amount that um, that we can look to support our our local community and also causes close to to, to our Druka's hearts. So, um, so the way we've done it so far is we've we've given a donation on our, our birthday. So that happened this week. So we've given some money to the the Water of Leaf Conservation Charity is the one that was picked out the hat. Um, and then as the business grows, we'll do we'll be more. Oh, brilliant! And happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, four years in. <laughs> Another four. Um, so where can people keep up to date with everything Jump Ship? Um, so you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at Jump Ship Beer. Uh, we have quite an active mailing list where I like to I like to write emails to people that are you know, not just spamming you, but hopefully telling our story of what's going on. Um, so you can sign up to our mailing list. Yeah, that's probably the best the best ways to keep up to date with what we're up to. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And whereabouts can we get your beer? Whereabouts can we get Jump Ship beer? Um, so we've got quite a lot of stockists, mainly in, in Scotland, so at Central Belt. Um, you can look on our website. We've got a list there. Um, we're also available online and jumpship.beer. Best place to go. Thank you very much for your time, Sonia. It's been fantastic chatting about Jump Ship beer, hearing all about your story, how you got into it very exciting times at the moment with the brewery and really looking forward to seeing what you get up to oh, thank you it's been great talking to you and jump chip are looking out for you too in 2024 as they've created a special 10 percent off code for podcast listeners so if you're looking to try out their range of alcohol free beers please use the code beer people 10 for 10 percent off their web shop at jumpship.beer during january and thank you very much for listening and i hope you can join me on the next one If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review or rating. This really helps us out and helps other people find the podcast, especially as we're starting out. You can follow us on social media, just search We Are Beer People. We have a website, wearebeerpeople.co.uk, and you can email us on wearebeerpeoplepod at gmail.com. But let us know what you think, share your thoughts, and if you have any recommendations for beer people you'd like to hear from. And until next time, don't forget, you, me, us, them. We are all beer people.